Hi, I'm Sissy Graham Lynch. Welcome to Fearless, helping you have a fearless faith in a compromising culture. It's Memorial Day weekend, and I know my social media will be flooded with pictures of people having barbecues, sitting by the poolside, enjoying their family. And many Americans, it is the kickoff to summer. And although it is okay to be enjoying the ones we love this weekend, and it's okay that we are having fun, it's important we do not forget what this day represents. I've asked my sister-in-law, Christy, to join me on today's episode. This is a subject which is it's very personal to her, and I would like her to give us a little bit of an insight and a better understanding on Memorial Day, which many Americans might not know or they might not even realize. And Christy, she's married to my brother, Edward, and Edward's a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army He served 16 years as active duty officer, and Edward now uh, serves in the reserves. And he did eight combat tours, and six of those were in Afghanistan, two were in Iraq. But together, I've watched Edward and Christy. They have sacrificed uh, much for the sake of this wonderful country. They've walked the journey with many who have lost their loved ones and spouses. And it was Christy who years ago, she challenged me of how I recognize Memorial Day, her and Edward, they were down visiting my family down in Fort Myers, Florida, and we were very intentional of how we spent that day. And Christy, you made sure we looked at, we went to two war memorials with our children that day, and we spent time talking about it and praying over it. And then, you know what? Later we did, we went and enjoyed a barbecue and we sat beside my pool, but you taught me to be very intentional with that day. And so I want to be clear, this podcast is not to be meant to be like speaking down on people. It's not meant to make people feel guilty for having a good time on Memorial Day. I really want this to challenge you, to bring conversation to your family. And I saw this, I believe it was on Reeves Across America. It said, remember, honor, and teach. And on today's Fearless Podcast, that's what I want to do. I want to encourage you to remember, challenge you to honor it encourage you to teach your children and the next generation that their freedom, it came at a great cost and sacrifice. Our freedom demands much of us. And I love this quote, Christy, you shared this with me years ago from Ronald Reagan. It said, freedom is never more than one generation from extinction. We did not pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day we'll spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in the United States where men were free. And I'm reminded of that quote, how precious the gift of freedom is. I'm reminded of the duty we have to pass on that honor to our children. And we kind of look in this pandemic that we face as a world now, how quickly life can change, how quickly freedoms can be taken away. And if we look at that on a greater scale, it could be quite scary. But Christy, thank you for joining me today. I'm very excited and I'm honored that you would share just part of your journey in the military, what Memorial Day looks for you. But to start it off, On a basic level, for those who are listening, who might not have taken the time to recognize Memorial Day, who might not even know truly what it is, explain to us what Memorial Day is. Yeah, I appreciate you having me, Sissy. And just to clarify, I'm not an expert. I'm not a history, you know, historian. But like you said, Memorial Day is a huge passion of mine because I know and love many that have lost uh, brave men and women. So Yeah, I think what I've observed in my military life um, is that many people confuse Veterans Day and Memorial Day, both wonderful days. Veterans Day honors our veterans who are servicemen and women who have served in the armed forces. So they are serving or have served. And that is always on November 11th, which is the end of World War I. Um, So great day. But Memorial Day is different. It is to honor those that have paid the ultimate sacrifice. It was originally called Decoration Day. And it originated after the Civil War. So it's we've had it for a long time, but it officially became a holiday in 1971. It was a federal holiday, and now it is observed on the last Monday of May. 
And so, like you said, many Americans, they have barbecues, they celebrate with their family, which is wonderful. But I also think we need to take it as a day to remember and honor in some way. In 2000, the National Moment of Remembrance was passed, and that is to ask all Americans at 3 p.m. to stop what they're doing and have a moment of silence. And I think it's a way that the country can be unified and do something at the same time to honor and solemnly acknowledge the sacrifices that have made for our freedom. You know, because like you said, freedom isn't free. Um, It's not handed down to us. We have to fight for it and protect it. And I think, sadly, so many don't realize that. You know, and that's why men and women serve. You know, they go to foreign soil so that the enemy doesn't come here. And I think sometimes we forget that because life is pretty peaceful here in America. And we have freedoms that many don't even know around the world. And so I also, we honor those that have been killed, but I also like to honor and remember the Gold Star family members. And that is a term used to describe family members that have lost a fallen soldier. Yeah, many people might not know that term. It's called a Gold Star family. For those who are listening and don't know what a Gold Star family is, those are families who have lost servicemen at war or in service. And these Gold Star family members, you know, every day is Memorial Day for them. And so... Memorial Day is a way one day, you know, to honor and pay tribute to the loved one that they miss every single day. And I think it's also a way to share their stories. You know, and most of them, they gather with battle buddies of the service member, uh, family members. They love hearing stories. And so, you know, if you know someone, I encourage you to share a story. It might seem small and trivial to you, but it means everything to that family member because their legacy lives on and saying their name. And, um, you know, it's important to learn their stories, speak their names and honor their legacy. And you and Edward, you have walked this journey with many people. You've lost friends. You've walked with wives who have lost their husbands. And this is very personal to you. Tell us about those journeys that you've walked and tell us what loss in the military is like. So just for your audience listening, you know, I come from a long line of service. You know, almost every male in my family has served in the military. My dad, my uncle, my grandparents, my cousins, my brothers. I mean, all of them. So I come from a long line of patriotism and love for our country. But it wasn't until I married Edward and, you know, a soldier at a time of war that I truly understand, understood the personal impact. And like you said, we have lost many friends and we've walked this uh, road of loss with many. So I, I have not lost somebody, so I won't even pretend to say I understand how they feel. But through their testimonies and allowing me in their pain, I've gotten to experience what it's like. And so, you know, we all know loss is difficult. And unfortunately, war has casualties. And that is a part, a price, that huge price of freedom that we enjoy comes with a price tag. And that is sacrifice and loss. And so... As we're engaged in our longest war in U.S. history, you know, and I think some people forget that we're still at war. People are still defending our country. And, you know, since 2001, we've been at war for 19 years. And so in those 19 years, we've lost 7,029 men and women. You know, and those sound like statistics, but let me tell you, they are sons and daughters and wives and husbands and brothers and cousins and aunts and uncles and nephews and nieces. And they have stories to tell and their family members want to share that. And so I just wanted to acknowledge and and introduce people to these family members, you know, that carry this sacrifice every single day. And it's a heavy weight, I want to tell you. And these people are resilient, um, but it's a weight. I love I rem- you've uh, written something before and it said each person's grief is unique as their fingerprint and every loss is different. Every story is different. Every spouse that's lost something, their grief is different. Tell us more about that. Grief is truly a fingerprint. It's unique to that person um, and that relationship with the one they've lost. And I've watched wives grieve in many different ways. You know, some move away instantly and want to get away from that community and away from it. And some want to stay and some want to walk with those. And, um, you know, everybody grieves differently. But the truth is they all grieve and they all have to go through grief. And, you know, so when Memorial Day comes around, you know, I think of many of these men and women. You know, we think of Laura Walker, Derek Hines, Jason Fingar, um, Jeremy Katzenberger, John Hallett. I mean, I could give you many names, but these, I just wanted to say some of them to acknowledge these represent loved ones 
left behind. And like you said, it is different in every person. Um, and also some of my friends, they say grief is like the ocean, you know, the waves, they come and they ebb and they flow. And some days are pounding with grief. And then some days they are celebrating and smiling and remembering and telling stories. And so I think that's something I want to tell people is that you don't just get over it in a year or a week, you know, and so, so often people flood, flood them in the beginning, but then they forget and life goes on. And these, you know, men and women have this grief that they carry for a lifetime. And so I just want to acknowledge. And so whether someone lost someone, you know, 10 years ago or last week, um, they have a scar, you know, and some have healed and, and moved on, but that scar is always there and that reminder. And so it's important to go to those memorials. And, you know, if you see someone, I'm sorry for your loss. Um, I mean, and again, everybody responds differently. Some don't want to let you in, but some do. And if they want to ask them stories, tell me about them. Some people love and their light, their eyes light up when they get the chance and someone asks, you know, and involve them in their pain. So it's looked different for many different friends, but the the same thing is that they have missed and grieved someone. You know, Christy, for you and Edward, this is personal. And as we said, you've walked this with so many wives and Memorial Day is something for you to honor those men and women. And I know on one deployment, Edward, uh, his brigade lost quite a few men. Was it about 41 Mm -hmm. men in that one deployment? And I think, like you said, we forget that we're still at war. I think in modern day technology or for whatever reason, war is really far off and it doesn't affect our daily lives for those who aren't in the military. And so we can quickly forget But just in that one deployment that y'all face, it was 41 men were taken. And like you said, those are sons, um, husbands and fathers, and it's heartbreaking. It's unfathomable. And recently you just interviewed your friend, Lisa, who lost her husband, John, who was a captain in the army. And she shares with you what that last deployment when he left, what that was like, and for her to find out that um, he had been killed and during that transition time. So let's hear a little bit of that interview. So Lisa, you are a dear friend. Um, My friend Lisa wears many hats. She is a working mom, mom of three, but you've just been heavy in my heart. I would love for you to share your story with the audience. And so would you just tell us about John? John loved. Serving. He loved his country, um, but he loved the soldiers who he served alongside. And it was incredibly valuable for him to be able to challenge himself every day, physically, mentally, emotionally. And we knew that the military was the right path for us. So we said, we're in, we're going to stay in through company command, and we'll just mm-hmm. keep taking it. He had one assignment to the next about the way forward for military career. And so we left Hawaii and then we went to Fort Benning, Georgia. We went to Fort Polk, Louisiana. We, you know, had a baby on the way at each duty station. Mm -hmm. And then in 2007, when Bryce was four weeks old, our middle child, we landed at then Fort Lewis, Washington. And that is where I met Lisa, Um, Fort Lewis, Washington. Um, So, yeah, so you have two babies. You've gone through deployments, many moves. And now you're faced with another year-long deployment. Can you talk to me about that? We had been graced with a period of, of not deploying. And at this point in 2007, we our friends have seen multiple deployments. And the op tempo, the operational tempo of our military was high. It was go, come home, go, come home, go, come home. And John was in a training position. He was an observer controller during our time. At Fort Polk, he was in a school at Fort Benning. So we had been graced with family time. And so professionally, John was ready for deployment. He was ready to to do what he had trained to do. And I think there's this sense of not obligation, but calling. And I would say a very robust calling for our servicemen and women. Um, When they volunteer to serve, they want that service to be in action, right? Not the scarce time they want to get. Um, 
they want to join their their fellow service members in the mission. And so John very much felt that. So he was ready to go. But it wasn't my first deployment anymore. Um, it was not quite, not quite as romantic as that first one. And I knew the days were long, the nights were lonely, and um, the risks were real. And so John's unit had trained. You know, obviously, John and Edward worked together, and their unit had trained to go to Iraq again. And then in 2009, we saw the surge to southern, well, the surge to Afghanistan. So John's unit switched to Afghanistan. And in July of 2009, just three weeks before our youngest child was to be born, John deployed to Kandahar. And I was sad and I was scared. And I was worried about how I was going to be a single parent to three young children for a year. Mm -hmm. And so John left. And then three weeks after John left, our daughter Heidi was born. And I remember you know, John and I talked earnestly about him leaving, not being there when the baby was born. And I was like, I've got that. And, and then I headed into Madigan to have the baby. And I remember telling the nurse, I said, I changed my mind. I want my husband here. And obviously that was, that was not a choice, but I had dear friends and, Amanda came to the hospital with me and Beth and Diane were watching my kids for me and you know, everybody just steps up and, and makes it happen. And so, you know, I had Heidi and then I came home and I remember talking on the phone to John. He says, I've never heard the baby cry. And I said, don't you worry. You've got a lifetime for that. Mm-hmm. And you know, the first few days, I remember trying were just nutty. I had two kids in diapers, newborn baby. My husband's deployed. And I remember, I remember crying one night, tried to do bath time. I thought, there's no way that I can do this for a year. Mm-hmm. And then I had this very calming moment where I realized it's not a year. I mean, it's not forever. It's a year. And just pull it together. You've got this. Mm-hmm. And for our family, though, it, it wasn't going to be just a year. So three weeks after Heidi was born, I learned the news that no military spouse wants to hear. So I was headed to a military family training meeting three weeks after Heidi's born. And I remember walking into the training and I spread out my papers and I have Heidi with me in her little bucket seat. And the rear detachment commander comes into this classroom and he taps me on the shoulder. And it was, it was Frankie. And Frankie was one of John's soldiers. And I remember Frankie said, oh, Miss Hallett, you need to come with me. And I was pretty flipped. And I was like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. like, no, you need to bring your papers. And so I remember I scooped up my papers and I pick up Heidi in her little bucket seat. And and Frankie, who's who's a friend, he's a soldier, he's eaten at my house. His face is impassive. Mm -hmm. And I remember we walked across this big grass great field and I kept asking Frankie almost almost demanding tell me John's okay tell me John's okay mm-hmm. and he says nothing and he takes me to he takes me to the battalion classroom and there are two gentlemen waiting for me and they're wearing their class A it's the green business suit of the army at the time and the gentleman on the right is holding a white piece of paper and I quickly realize it's a script and he reads it. The Secretary of Defense regrets to inform you that your husband, Captain John L. Hallett, is believed to have perished in the fires. And I stopped listening. Mm-hmm. They said believed. And at home, I had a three-year-old, I had a one-year-old, and in my arms is this, this baby who my husband will never meet. I just know they have to be wrong. And I, I don't know why, but somehow I drive myself home and on the way that the military spouse network is notified and, and the people come together. And I remember sitting on the bottom step in front of our daddy wall. I was so worried my kids wouldn't know what their daddy looked like. They'd covered the door to the garage with pictures of John. Mm-hmm. And I just sat in front of that wall looking at those pictures and then General Mathis called and he said, Lisa, I'm so sorry to 
heard the news about John. What can we do? And I said, they said, believe. And he said, I'm so sorry. And our lives were changed. John wasn't going to become home. And that lifetime that I had promised John was just never to be ours. I've heard that story so many times, and yet it always makes me cry. And, you know, as, as we hear her story, and she said about, she also talks about she was a single mom while he was deployed. And then that transition time, she was just kind of lost because she was still a single mom now that he was gone and, you know, meeting the casket. Those are things that we cannot fathom for the majority of us. You, you've witnessed it. You've seen it. That has been your reality for the last 16 years. And you're in your Edwards service. And why, when you remember women like that and in your mind and you see those images in your head that are forever with you, why is it so important for Americans to remember and to honor Memorial Day? I mean, there's so many reasons. Um, first of all, that's why I love that you're introducing people to Lisa. I wish everyone could meet her and meet all of my friends because they all have a story. And um, But I think another big reason is, you know, Jesus said in Luke 12, 48, to whom much is given, much is required. You know, and some versions say demanded. And I truly believe, you know, living in America and being an American, we have been given much. I mean, we've been given freedom, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, things that we don't even, we take for granted, but we've been given much and it's been paid with a price. And so I think that demands something from us. And you and I both love the quote, there's only two defining forces ever offered to die for you, Jesus Christ and the American soldier. One died for your soul, the other died for your freedom. And you've just not, as Christians, maybe we can grasp a better understanding of that. You know, that sign hangs in our uh, lodge in Alaska for some, at Samaritan's Purse Lodge. And how thankful I am for that reminder of you just saying that Jesus Christ, you know, he died for you and I to know freedom. He died for our souls. And there is much expected of us after that. Yeah. And I'm glad you shared Lisa's story because, I mean, all my friends have taught me something, all my Gold Star friends. But Lisa taught our whole community and that whole brigade. Those guys were gone for a year. And John died in the first month of that deployment. And he died in August. And in February, Lisa started a running movement. We gathered and prayed and said the names out loud. And many of the widows came. And they allowed us into their pain. And they allowed us to see what it looked like. And She taught me the importance of saying their names, telling their stories, honoring their legacy, you know, and as Americans, some don't know someone that's lost, um, but find out about them. You know, you can, any soldier that's killed, you can Google them and find their story and pray more specifically for their family. And they do, they represent, they're not a statistic, they represent a person with a story with hundreds of people that know and love them. And so for that reason, you know, we honor and remember for those family members. And like you said, yeah, that Ronald Reagan has some of my favorite quotes, but that's one of my favorites. It is not handed down to us. And it's like in that quote you said, it's like our salvation. You know, Jesus died for our soul. The American soldier died for our freedom. But it's we have to make a choice, right? And so for our salvation, for Christ, we have to choose it. You know, we don't hand it down to our kids because we're Christians, but we do need to teach them. So I teach my kids the Bible and I teach my kids about Christ and I hope and pray that they all accept Christ. And same thing with the soldiers. You know, John 15, 13 says, no greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And, you know, that is what a soldier does. They lay down their life for their friends and their family and their country. And there is no greater love except the love of God. You know, and that was sacrificial. He died for enemies. He died for people that cursed and hated and beat him and mocked him and rejected him. But both of them require a choice on our behalf. And so I'm thankful you're bringing awareness because I think we do as Americans. We choose. Am I going to live up to this sacrifice? Yeah. And in this podcast, it's so important, as I said earlier, to teach. And with that quote from Ronald Reagan, this is to teach the next generation that we have a duty as moms and as dads and a generation that just knows how precious our freedom is. We have a duty to teach the next generation. We can look at that in the Old Testament with the Israelites of how quickly generations would forget God's goodness. 
um, how quickly we can forget the sacrifices that were made. We'll never know all the names in history of men and women who sacrificed for this country going back to the Revolutionary War and, um, and to this day of men serving still overseas. But as we teach this next generation, it's unique. Your family is unique and your children, you have four children and you've raised them in this military life and military conversations and talk is a part of their normal. You know, they, they have friends who've, whose fathers have lost their eyesight. They have friends that, um, you know, have just been brutally uh, with left with scars. And but for most people, that's not their norm. And how do we talk this conversation with the next generation? You know, my and I try not to hide it from my children. We work with Operation Heal Our Patriots. They see men who've lost their legs and have lost their arms. And I don't hide that. Even for my three-year-old, he came up to me, I shared with you, and he said, Mom, I'm so thankful Uncle Edward didn't die at war. And it just like took me off guard. And I said, and we talked about it, even at three years old. But what are some ways that you encourage families? That's not their normal conversation. How do you encourage them to teach the next generation? Well, you know, and I do. I worry that we're going to lose that gratitude. Yeah, and the pride um, of our country. And now that less than, you know, 1% serve in the military. So you're right. Many people don't even know someone in the military. And that makes me sad. Um, And that's why I feel such a burden to introduce you to these people. um, Because... If you don't know someone, I want to introduce you. Um, and so there's many ways. Um, and I'll give you some of my favorite websites, but there's there's some that have great resources. My dear friend, she's a chaplain's wife. She made a great website, has a great Memorial Day link with print offs, you know, that you can color and, you know, mail, send to a Veterans Association, you know, um, group. Um, there's Wear Blue Run to Remember, you know, there's, that is one that you can pledge miles to run in honor. And if you don't know someone, they will give you someone, they'll assign you and they'll let you get to know their story, you know, share with their family that you're running for them. Yeah. You sent me a devotional of one of your friends, Kylie, who lost her husband, Jake, Mm -hmm. and she had written a devotional and she just recently got remarried and, you know, God has just his story of redemption and restoring her and her children's lives. It's a sweet story that you've shared with me, but she writes that proof that God answers, he redeems and makes all things new and brings beauty for ashes as we wait on him for the answers only he knows. I love to say it and I believe it. And she shares this quote, the stories he writes are both the ones we couldn't but also wouldn't write. He knows best. And I think that's true for anybody listening, whether you're military or not, whether that storm you're facing, that some of the greatest stories are the ones we wouldn't choose to write, but God does and he knows best and that we can find rest in a sovereign God. And I hope that this podcast, once again, it's an encouragement to people. It's a challenge. It's to remind you Uh, that our freedom, it came at a great, great cost. And it demands a lot of us to to tell and teach the next generation. And as most service members we know, they love providing that freedom. They love providing that protection for Americans to be able to have barbecues, to be able to sit by the pool and either go to the beach and enjoy their family. That Memorial Day, that that weekend, that kickoff to summer, that they enjoy providing that. But we are to take this day, Memorial Day, and recognize it for what it is, that this is Memorial Day. And that's what it is. It's a memorial. It's not a holiday. This is a day to remember and to honor those who died, giving us that freedom to be able to have a barbecue, to be able to enjoy our family and friends, how thankful we are for their service. And once again, in the show notes, we will include different ways to uh, for your family to remember, to honor, different links to get involved. And Christy, I want to thank you. Thank you for Edward and your service and um, walking that journey with spouses and wives who have lost their loved ones and being there to help them pick up the pieces, to point them back to God's truth, that God still is not done writing their story. So thank you for sharing the importance of Memorial Day from your perspective. It's my, it's my greatest joy. Now 
as we close, I hope this episode is an encouragement to you and your family. Maybe it challenges you on how and reflect back on how you are going to look at Memorial Day, what you and your family can do to remember those who've given the ultimate sacrifice for you and for me. And as we close, I want to leave you with this once again, a Ronald Reagan quote. And it said, the United States and the freedom for which it stands, the freedom for which they died must endure and prosper. Their lives remind us that freedom is not bought cheaply. It has a cost and imposes a burden. And just as they whom we commemorate were willing to sacrifice, so too must we in a less final, less heroic way, be willing to give ourselves. Thank you for joining me, Sissy Graham Lynch, on another episode of Fearless. I'm so thankful for my sister-in-law, Christy, for joining me today. Enjoy your Memorial Day weekend. I pray that you do enjoy it with your family, but take the time to remember those who've given their lives. I wasn't